Good morning. Happy Tuesday. Um, before we start the chapter today, I just wanted to give you a little background information. So remember, this story is set uh, in 1937. Um, right now we're in the fall of 1937, um, which was between uh, World War One, which ended in 1918, and World War Two, which started just a couple years after that. Um, the U.S. got in N41, but um, other European countries were fighting as early as 38 and 39, uh, which is really soon in our story. Um, anyway, so in our story, when our story takes place, World War II has not happened yet. Uh, we're just on the brink of it, but it has not happened yet. And everybody has gone through World War I pretty recently. 1918 would have been just 20 years earlier. Um, and if you hadn't gone through World War II yet, and you'd only had World War I, you wouldn't have called it World War I because there was no two. Uh, instead, they called it the Great War, or to, the War to Remember. Um, and at the end of it, when they, when they had their peace treaty, um, also known as an armistice, uh, they ended it at the 11th hour, so 11 o'clock in the morning, on the 11th day of the 11th month in 1918, so November 11 of 1918. Don't know why they did it on the 11, on the 11, on the 11 of 18, but they did. They thought, I guess they thought it was a, a good sounding time. Uh, so that's where um, our original Veterans Day came from. They didn't call it Veterans Day back then, they called it Armistice Day or Truce Day. And when they remembered specifically World War One and World War One veterans, um, and in this chapter that we'll be reading, they they celebrate uh, Armistice Day. However, after World War Two happened and you had two great wars, um, they started calling it obviously World War One and World War Two, and then they changed Armistice Day to be called the Veterans Day, which is um, a holiday that we celebrate all veterans from all U.S. wars. Um, so that's just a little background information. When you hear Armistice Day or the Great War, that's what they're talking about. Um, and uh, World War One really was terrible, um, especially it, in the trenches. They had um, they didn't use it so much in World War Two, but they had a, a gas that they would um, gases they would um, spray on each other, and um, the gases were really harmful. Um, they would hurt your lungs. They could kill you. Um, they could like permanently disfigure you. Um, mentally incapacitate you um, and you will meet somebody in this chapter who has who has been in the trenches and uh, who was gas and has like been permanently um, uh, hurt for the rest of their life so uh, this chapter is called a minute in the morning I hated sleeping upstairs in that big square room at grandpa doubt grandma's Joey wasn't across the hall like summers past when we were kids the matters, sorry, the mattress on the big brass bed had more craters than the moon, and you could barely see your hand in front of your face. In Chicago, it never really got dark, not like this, and the house was too quiet, though things scuttled in the walls. Once in a while, a thumping sound came from overhead in the attic. I didn't think Grandma's house was haunted. What ghost would dare? But she slept downstairs to spare herself the climb, so I was miles away from anybody. What I'd have done without my radio, I don't know. Grandma could hear all over the house, didn't like extra noise, so I played the Philco at night in bed, muffled under the covers. With radio, you never knew. I could only pick up the Chicago stations if there weren't a, a cloud in the sky, and it took a crisp, clear night to bring in KMOX from St. Louis. I didn't listen to much news. Most of it was bad. They still couldn't find Amelia Earhart, and 10 million men were out of work. I knew my dad was one of them. But I loved everything else on the radio. Baby Snooks, Fibber McGee and Molly, the A&P Gypsies, Edgar Bergen, Charlie McCarthy, Whispering Jack Smith. The best thing about radio was that you couldn't see anything, so you pictured it in your mind. All the men were just as handsome as movie stars, as Tyrone Power. And all the women were as beautiful as you'd hoped you'd be. Their voices were who they were, and the biggest voice belonged to Kate Smith, the songbird of the South. 
that fall, the whole country was singing her, When the moon comes over the mountain, every beam brings a dream dear of you. A real song, actually. So is Kate Smith and all those other people. I lie there in the orange glow of the Philco dial, listening to the world. Then I'd see how fast I could fall asleep after I shut it off. By November, I was cold. Wind howled in the eaves and found every chink in the house. With the window jam shut, there was still a stiff breeze in the room, and I could see my breath. I took to wearing my old chenille bathrobe to bed over my pajamas. I considered wearing my plaid coat, too, but thought I'd better save something back for winter. Finally, I made the mistake of complaining to Grandma. You never saw a more surprised woman in your life. Cold, she said. It doesn't get cold anymore. The climate's changed. When I was a girl, we had to walk in our sleep to keep from freezing to death. One morning, after a hard frost, Grandma stood at the foot of the stairs banging a spoon against the pan, her wake-up call. When I came into the kitchen, dressed in three layers, she was pouring batter on the waffle iron, and coffee perked. She let me drink coffee. The scent of her cooking breakfast was to follow me through life. But I was sulky that morning. Grandma, what am I doing up at the crack of dawn? There's no school today. She turned to give me one of her repertoires of surprised looks. It was daylight, and that was like noon to her. Of course there's no school. It's Armistice Day. People took Armistice Day seriously back then. Nineteen years after the end of the Great War, in Chicago, everything stopped at 11 o'clock. Even the streetcars. People stood for a minute of silence, remembering. And the turkey shoot, Grandma said. I knew they had a turkey shoot at Armistice Day down here. Posters were up in Moore's store and Weedenbach's bank. An awful thought struck me. A turkey shoot? What if Grandma took part? I remember Grandpa Dowdle's old 12-gauge double-barreled Winchester behind the wood box. Grandma read my mind. She was turning bacon and waved me away with the fork. If I, could out at, if I took out after an old turkey with a 12-gauge, I'd blow him apart. There'd be nothing left but waddle and shoot. A terrible picture of an exploding turkey raining feathers hung in my mind. But Grandma said, it's not like that. They use air rifles and buy chances to shoot at paper cutouts. They don't shoot real turkeys. What would you do with a plug turkey this far ahead of Thanksgiving? You could keep it upstairs in my bedroom where it just would stay frozen, but I didn't say so. Besides, I don't compete, Grandma pursed her lips, ladylike, except for the toothpick. It's the men and the boys. You know how they love an excuse to make a clatter and show off. A turkey shoot was bound to be outdoors, and my nose was just now thawing. Then why are we going, I asked, hopeless. For the burgoo, Grandma explained. I didn't even ask. The Armistice Day turkey shoot was held on the Abernathy farm. Grandma and I went out there on Shanks ponies, meaning we walked. They'd planted next year's wheat, and the autumn colors had faded. It was getting into the gray time of year. We tramped the road south into the wind until we saw horses tied to the fence posts and cars pulled off the shoulder. Grandma wore Grandpa Dowdle's old coat. I wore his hunting jacket and dungarees under a shirt, sorry, under a skirt. The longer I lived down here, the more I was starting to look like Mildred Burdick. A wool cap pulled down to my eyebrows didn't help. The Abernathy farm looked long abandoned, though people milled around it. Out in a the field, they'd set up frames with orange paper targets more or less shaped like turkeys, and there was a gun rack. Since the turkey shoot was for charity, men in little caps were selling chances. They were the American Legion, veterans of the Great War. The barn was in bad shape, and the house hadn't seen a lick of paint in the century. All the ladies were clustered on the back porch. Does anybody live here? I asked Grandma. Abernathy's, she said, swinging aside the gate and marching up the walk. That's Mrs. Abernathy on the door, or in the door. The other ladies clustered around a table on the porch beside a rustling cream separator. Sorry, a rusting cream separator. Mrs. Abernathy stood by, holding her elbows and looking down. She was a forlorn lady with a sweater pulled over her apron. In the yard, a big pot hung from a tripod over a crackling fire. It was the burgoo, a stew made with whatever you had on hand, white meat and red meat, and maybe a squirrel, old vegetables, heavy on the turnips, potato wedges for body, stewed with tomatoes for color, onion to taste. It was served at every outdoor event, from an auction to a hanging, as Grandma would say. A small lady in a headscarf 
under an army cap, stirred the burgoo with a wooden paddle. Grandma veered off the walk and took the paddle out of her hand. I'll spell you, Emma. Go for some kindling, she said, and the small lady fell back. The whole porch was watching. I wanted to put some distance between me and Grandma, so I drifted out, out of the yard and down to the barn lot, where the crack and pop of air rifles set rent the air. Men and boys were ranked along the firing line before each distant turkey target. I didn't recognize any of them, but then they were all in caps and ear flaps. They took their shooting seriously, but man and boy, they either weren't crack shots or those paper targets were harder to hit than they looked. Both the barn and the shed were taking up pelting. The American legionnaires were hand handling over the rifles and reloading them. And I must have been standing too close. A legionnaire handed me a rifle, and I took it. At the touch of cold steel, I froze. From the way I was dressed, did he think I was a boy? Had he missed the skirt over my dungarees? That's like pants, dungarees. This might have been get Annie Oakley's big chance, but I was embarrassed to death. I couldn't wait to get rid of the rifle. I handed it off to the shooter next to me. It was Augie Fluke, his, with his flaps down. Ever since Grandma had glued his head, Augie had never looked me in the eye. He was sulk a sulker by nature. Anyway, now he blinked at the sight of me, but his eyes narrowed, and I read his mind. He was going to show me a thing or two about marksmanship. He knew my grandma was a dead shot, but she was a mere woman. Did I read all that in Augie's squint? If you're going to read minds, start with a simple one. He jammed the butt of the rifle into his sloping shoulders. His tongue lolled out as he sighted down the barrel and took considered aim. Then, as bad luck would have it, a scared rabbit, a big cottontail, darted from under the barn and across the, the front of the targets. Seeing live play, prey blurred Augie's judgment. Forgetting the paper target, he swung his rifle around to follow the rabbit. He swung too far. A big black car, a Buick, I think, was parked on the sideline. Just as the rabbit disappeared under it, Augie fired. The crowd looked at the car. In the silence, you could hear a hiss as the back tire, a sidewall, began to go flat. A legionnaire howled and threw his cap on the ground. He must have been the head legionnaire because the cap had medals pinned on it. Dag nabbit, that was a new tire. Who done that? Augie went rigid and thought about thrusting the rifle back into my hands. Then he flung it down on the ground, plunged headlong into the crowd. They made way for him, whooping and clapping and pretending to duck. He vaulted a fence and hit the road running back to town. So a turkey shoot wasn't as boring as I expected. Uh, but I went on watching from the yard. They shot more. Then the head legionnaire threw up his arm. Troopers, hold your fire. It's pretty near 11 o'clock. Silence fell. Some in the crowd took out their watches to make sure. It was the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, the moment when the armistice of the Great War had been signed in 1918. We all turned to face east as people did towards France. I turned to see the back view of Grandma. Her left hand was outstretched holding the paddle upright in the burgoo. Her right hand must have been over her heart. Her old hat was pulled low and pinned tight, and her hair was escaping. I never saw her shoulders straighter. The ladies on the porch stood facing a blank wall because it was east. Mrs. Abernathy had turned in the door. In utter stillness measured at minute, with only the crying wind and the rattle of a dry creeper growing up the side of the Abernathy house. Just then, did I see a face in a dormer window upstairs? I might have. I wasn't sure. Then the head legionnaire boomed out, Gentlemen, lock and load! The firing began like popping corn. At lunchtime, a bucket brigade of ladies in legionnaire caps brought pails of burgoo from the pot to the porch. Now Grandma was up there, planted at the end of the table. Again, she'd pushed right in. She threw back her coat. Underneath, she wore an apron that was new to me, though homemade. It was like the ones the hot dog sellers wore at Wrigley Field, with big square pockets in front to collect money. Stomping in the cold, a crowd snaked up the porch steps. The Legionnaire Auxiliary's ladies handed over steaming tin mugs of burgoo. The line edged along until they came to Grandma. A mug of burgoo was a dime. The first customer, a big old farmer, handed Grandma a coin. Can't change a quarter, she said, dropping into her pocket and looking straight through him. 
That's 50 cents for two, the next man said. I'll take 30 cents and change. Haven't got it, Grandma replied, banking the 50 cent piece. By now, I was standing next to the porch just below her, bug-eyed, to, what, what, to see what she was getting away with. Even I knew the next customer, Mr. J L. J. Wiedenbach, the banker. He was a he was a big, sleek, slack-mouthed man, as tight with money as Grandma herself. He didn't wear a legion cap. He may have been too old for the war. Anyway, he'd stayed home and made money. He held out a very thin dime. Grandma looked at the dime like she'd never seen one. Her eyes were circles of astonishment. That won't do, uh, L.J., she said loud. Mr. Wiedenbach winced. The porch sagged with customers of his bank. What do you want from me, Mrs. Dowdle? He muttered. From you? I wouldn't say no to a $5 bill, Grandma said louder than before. If you can get the boot lace loose from around your wallet, the boys who fought at the front didn't count the cost. The crowd began to murmur. The auxiliary ladies serving at the table stood tall and together. Their men had fought, many at the front. The thought of five dollars for a cup of cooling burgoo made Mr. Edenbach's eyes water. The line jostled him from behind, everybody all ears. He jammed two thorny fingers into his watch pocket and came up with a silver dollar, as high as he'd go. Grandma held wide her apron pocket for the banker to make his deposit. Who's next, she said as she, he stalked off the porch. In short, she got more than a dime off everybody, except of those from whom she knew couldn't pay more. In some cases, she could make change. In the some others, she couldn't. Once I saw her palm the dime back into the hand that offered it. A few people dropped out of line when the word reached them that Grandma was cashier. But it was burgoo or nothing. When the last customer settled up, Grandma had a pouch on her like a kangaroo. Bloating was beneath her, but the toothpick in her mouth moved in a jaunty way, like a tiny baton conducting a small symphony. She helped herself to burgoo. When she noticed me, she handed me down a mug. It wasn't too bad, if you worked up an appetite. Down the table, the Legion Auxiliary ladies drew into a knot to confer. Then their leader advanced upon Grandma. By the name on her cap, she was Mrs. W.T. Sheets. Her medals jangled importantly. Grandma observed her approach. Mrs. Dowdle, said Mrs. Sheets, I'm here to tell you that you're twice as bald-faced and brazen, and yes, I have to say, shameless as the rest of us girls put together. If the presence of these witnesses, I'm on record for saying that you outdo the most two-faced, two-fisted, short-changer, flim-flim artist and full-time extortionist anybody's ever saw working this part of the country. And all I have to say is, God bless you for your good work. With a turn, small turn of hand, Grandma waved Mrs. Sheets away. Mrs. Sheets remained at her post. Mrs. Dowdle, she went on, you're not everybody's cup of tea. Well, it's common knowledge, isn't it? But we girls would be proud as punch to have you join our auxiliary if you're a veteran's wife. Did your late husband go to war? Only with me, Grandma said, and he lost every time. <laughs> I stood in the yard, clutching my tin mug. The knitted cap cut a groove in my forehead. My feet were blocks of ice. Grandpa Dowdle's hunting jacket smelled like dead ducks. But I'd never seen Grandma near this much money. I couldn't blink till I saw what she was going to do with it. The auxiliary ladies were collapsing the table and carrying their dirty mugs inside. Grandma followed them into the house, and I followed Grandma. Mrs. Abernathy's kitchen made Grandma look like a hall of mirrors at the Palace of Versailles. The floor sloped. A pump stood over the sink, and a coal oil lamp hung above the table. Cl clanking loose change, Grandma looked on as the auxiliary ladies went to work, dipping water out of the reservoir to wash the mugs. They poured the leftover burgoo into quart jars to leave with Mrs. Abernathy. They worked like beavers, drying the cups and boxing them up for next time. They wiped down the kitchen, leaving it cleaner than they'd found it. All the while, Mrs. Abernathy stood in the corner, as if it wasn't her kitchen at all. She was so thin, you could almost see through her. Her eyes were vacant. She looked tired to death. Then the other ladies were gone. It was just Grandma and me and ghostly Mrs. Abernathy in the dim kitchen. Something was about to happen, and I didn't know what. In the flickering light, Grandma spilled all the change onto the counter, the tabletop. It rolled and glittered. Grandma fished to find L.J. Wiedenbach's silver dollar. She held it up in triumph. Mrs. Abernathy stood at her elbow. 
The lamplight found all the hollows in her cheeks. At the sight of the money, she brought her hands up to her face. Oh, mercy, she said in a husky voice. In all the years before, it's never been better than twelve dollars. Grandma nodded knowingly. Them auxiliary gals mean well, but they're not enterprising. Burgoo for a dime. Grandma shrugged at the thought. Then, a little shyly, she said, will, you, will it see you through till next year? It looks like riches to me, Mrs. Abernethy muttered, and it'll have to see us through. Grandma got busy. We better bank all this money in coffee cans for safekeeping. Mrs. Abernethy went for the cans. They scooped together, feeling all the money playing through their fingers, hearing the crash in the cans. Shall we count it? Grandma wondered. Oh, no, Mrs. Abernethy said quick. It scared me to know how much. I thought I knew everything then. The veterans ran the turkey shoot to raise money for the American Legion. Their wives sold burgoo to help Mrs. Abernathy. It was time to leave. She couldn't hide her coffee cans as long as we were there. But Grandma said, how is he? Mrs. Abernathy looked aside into the shadows. He don't change much. Will you step up to see him? He won't know, but we don't get company and it's quiet after the turkey shoot. Mrs. Abernathy took notice of me for the first time. I don't know if you want the girl to... She can take it, Grandma said. So I knew whatever it was, I'd have to. I followed behind them up the stairs, numb with not knowing. It was so low ceilinged up there that Grandma had to duck. Mrs. Abernathy pushed open a door and I smelled ointment in a sick room. It was under the slant of a roof. A wheelchair, an old time one with three wheels and a wicker back stood by the dormer window. He was sitting in it, Mrs. Abernathy's son. She'd tied him into the chair with flannel strips and his head was fallen back. His face was slick and raw and his jaw hung open. He was far thinner than his mother and his arms hung useless down the sides of the chair. When Mrs. Abernathy touched his shoulder, he turned toward her. Then you could tell he was blind. He turned his head away. Nobody spoke. There was nothing to say. Grandma and Mrs. Abernathy stood together for a minute, a minute like the morning. Then we left. We went in a hurry past the coffee cans on the kitchen table because Grandma didn't want thanks. Outside, I was surprised to see it was still daylight, surprised the world was still there. The turkey shoot was over, and the crowd's gone. Down in the barn lot, Mrs. W.T. Sheets sat in the big Buick, up on the jack. Mr. Sheets hunkered down by the back fender. He was having trouble changing the wheel, and his spare looked low. The air was blue around him. Grandma and I turned out the gate and along the road back to town. She set her mouth against the wind, and it had turned, so we were walking into it again. There was some winter in the wind. She tramped along, listening so intently to the quiet that I said, Grandma, tell me. Her boy was gassed in the trenches, Grandma said, and shot up. He, we went on, and the towel rise, rising on the horizon. He gets a check from the government, but it don't keep them. But Grandma, aren't there veterans' hospitals where he could go? She don't want to give him up, she, Grandma said. She lost him once already. We walked a narrow stretch between the road and the ditch, single file. Then, just above the sighing wind, she said, the trenches are filled in, but the boys are still dying. Then I could read her thoughts, and I knew what this day meant. Mrs. Abernathy's son could have been my dad. It was farther coming back than going. Counting fence posts made it longer. Finally, we were in town, walking under bare branches. Grandma was putting the day behind her. You could see it in her stride. We turned at the business block past Wiedenbach's bank. Something brought Grandma up short in front of Moore's store. Under the turkey shoot posters was a display of sweetheart soap. She stopped dead, though she made her own soap. Beside the display was a big picture of Kate Smith, the songbird of the South, hand-colored. I remember black and white photos till then. She leaned out of the frame, smiling broadly. In her hand was a cake of soap. Below was her testimonial. I start each day with a song in my heart and a facial with sweetheart soap. Grandma looked closer. Looky there, she said. That's Kate Smith. Do you suppose that's a good picture of her? I hadn't any idea she was such a big, full-figured woman. Kate Smith was a very big, very full-figured woman. She was as big as Grandma. Grandma gazed at her picture with approval. Then on she walked with almost a spring in her step, though she was wearing boots. 
By and by, I heard her humming. She wasn't a musical woman, but it took me a block to figure and half to recognize what the tune was. It was, when the moon comes over the mountain, every beam brings a dream dear of you. All right. So that was a minute in the morning. Um, I hope you guys are all doing your work at home. Um, looking forward to getting all of those PowerPoints from everybody. Don't forget, um, you guys have eye station tests to be taking. Mrs. Zabala really wants everyone to make sure that they get those done, um, even though you're not at school. So I would suggest doing one a day, maybe like math today and reading tomorrow um, to get those tests taken. Take your time, do your best. Um, and uh, I'll send you the scores when I when I get them on my um, computer. All right, see you guys later.